Yo, what's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. And today we're going to be talking about the picks that I made for UFC 300, where I went right and where I went wrong. Prelims, I went 6 and 2. Main card, I went 1 and 4. End of the night, obviously at 7 and 6. Now again, there's a, a there's one or so that I'm like, "Ooh, why did I pick that?" because I knew better, but there's other ones where I was like, "All right, I understand the risk." So, without wasting any body time let's talk about my ufc 300 picks starting at the very very bottom first we had davis and figueredo versus cody garbrandt i knew 100 percent that cody garbrandt was going to be very hesitant he was going to be trying to pick his shots a little bit more did he look fast sure did his striking look good not really didn't do a whole lot Davis and figueredo is just the more well-rounded better overall fighter than cody garbrandt in 2024 hell David Figueredo is better than Cody Garbrandt at any point in his career. I don't care when he was 10 and 0, 11 and 0, 9 and 0. Don't care. Don't think he was 11 and 0, but you get my point. Figueredo defeated him by submission at, at the end of round number two. Next, we go on to I picked Figueredo. Thought he would he would finish he would finish him with punches or hurt him with punches and then submit him. Just able to submit him. Uh, Bobby Green versus Jim Miller. I thought Jim Miller would be a little bit more well-rounded. I did suspect him to go at Bobby Green early, as he did. Um, the first round was closer. He was getting uh, pop shot at a little bit too much. Close first round, I believe. But I didn't think Jim had won that first, but possibly. Second round, Bobby Green found his rhythm, found his groove. And Jim Miller was just kind of staying in no man's land, which was what got him hurt multitude of times in that matchup started busting up his eye hurting him a lot you see the dog in gym you see how hard he is to put away but he he got beat up um did hurt bobby green oh yeah he definitely won the first round because he hurt him numerous times and had him running away but um second round again he couldn't close that distance he couldn't get close enough to land his big punches i thought he'd be a little bit more well-rounded going for takedowns stuff like that chose not to really do that now third round came around and bobby green just beating him up bobby did get hurt at the end of round three with a big left hook a big left straight by jim miller same punch he'd been throwing basically the whole time but he did hurt bobby green but the damage had been done to jim miller and he just couldn't mount any any offense after that um they did choose to um go in the middle of the octagon and throw down and Jim Miller ate a big straight punch or a left hook. It was one of the two, a left straight or a left hook. Um, and it hurt him really bad. Survived, was able to get up and go to the scorecards, all these things. And Jim Miller gets loses 29-27, 30-25, and 29-26, something like that. So Bobby Green looked great. The worries I had was his chin, which, again, he did get caught by a guy that isn't necessarily known for his power so the questions are still there for me but bobby green did what bobby green does and he's able to keep that distance with his punches with a guy like jim miller who didn't use his wrestling didn't use his grappling so great win for bobby green to get right back on track so next we move to jessica andrage which i got that one wrong i thought jim miller would win a uh would get a submission and then jessica andrage versus marina rodriguez via Beats her by a decision. First round, Marina looks really, really good. Striking looks crisp, but she was keeping her chin way up in the air. And I believe, if I remember correctly, Andraj at the end, at the end of the first and I think the third round, one of the, whichever the points, the bigger shots were from Andraj. You could see Rodriguez getting tired. All of these things. She got around down to the ground and wasn't able to do, do a whole lot. The big power strikes were from Andrade. Marina just had a good game plan but couldn't adapt when uh, Andrade was able to close that distance. And that was kind of her downfall in that fight. Next, we have Renato Mercano defeating Jalen Turner in the uh, TKO in the second round. Four minutes, 11 seconds in the second round. So, Turner had a walk-off KO. Literally, he walked off. Uh, had the KO. Had him dead to rights. He was donezo. And then Jalen Turner doesn't follow up. And he lets him get up and lets him stay in the match. And there's points where Mercano gets him down. It's like, yeah, he's really good down there, which we all talked about. All the people that were talking about this fight was... Jalen Turner doesn't want Mercano getting him down because Mercano is very good down there. His striking defense is almost the worst. It's as bad as Muhammad Usman's is. It's terrible. But he's able to close the distance by taking punches. 
and getting him down and getting his these fighters down to the ground and do well down there because again he's good down there and then he kept getting Turner down there and being super heavy on him and the pressure was nuts as you could see in the fight and then he just started to unload had some good ground and pound early in the fight Turner couldn't get out of positions and he just couldn't get out and he kind of turtled away and Makano was able to get the finish so good job Renato Mercano. That was another one. Two and two at this point. Then Diego Lopez versus Sadiq Yusuf finished a minute and a half into round number one by Diego Lopez. Called this exactly. Uh, I just thought the firepower, I thought this would be later in the fight. I think I thought the first round, Sadiq Yusuf is very, very good. It's later in the fight that he gets caught or tires out and then gets hurt, loses the fight, whichever way. And Diego Lopez was able to catch him with, twice with some big uppercuts. And it hurt him real bad. He couldn't recover. And let me tell you this. We have a star in Diego Lopez. He is something special. Let me tell you. Called out uh, some really fun fighters. Mavzar he wants a rematch with. And then Taporia he also wants a fight with. Then uh, Kayla Harrison defeated Holly Holm by submission round number two. People were picking Holly Holm. Don't understand it. Their, their explanations were that Holly Holm, as a striker, this is kind of a Ronda Holly matchup. Again, years later. The problem with that is Holly Holm hasn't been that striker really since that fight. She had another performance against uh, um, uh, Urain Aldana where she looked great. But since that fight, she's really wee all the way down. But she's 43 years old. I think that's what a lot of it is. She just doesn't trust that striking anymore because she can't necessarily take the punishment she used to take and, you know this is the second time she's been finished by submissions the uh, uh silva one changed to no contest which is whatever is stupid she still watched her get guillotined and my whole thing was yeah as a striker sure she can she can uh finish she can uh do good things against harrison because harrison's striking is not great the issue is is holly Holm is been closing that distance and looking more to uh grapple you can't do that with a girl like Harrison. Now, she did reverse Harrison at one point, followed the momentum, reversed her, and sure, did great there. You're still a striker, though. You're still a striker. Like that That's the reality of it. So, Kayla Harrison get a dominating performance against Holly Holm. Hopefully, she retires. Hopefully. And then we go to, which I had Harrison winning anyway. So, then we go to uh, Aljo, Aljamain Sterling versus uh, Calvin Cater. Had Sterling by decision. Um, the, the biggest thing in this one for me was Calvin Cater. He has very, very good uh, striking, but he does hesitate a lot. And and we've seen in this matchup, we've seen that to the next level. We've seen that his confidence wasn't there to defend these takedowns. Again, we've seen him. Uh, uh, Sharapov, Shagam, Magomed Sharapov, that guy was able to do it. You know, Aljo looked good. He looked fast, he looked strong and his top pressure. It was awesome. I don't necessarily know how he would do against guys like Brian Ortega because you enter on him on certain ways. You're going to be submitted. That's the reality on that one. So, um, I'm interested to see what he could do in this weight class. He looked good. Again, he looked fast. I was happy to see Aljo look so damn good. And then we have Yuri Prohaska versus Alexander Rakic. Uh, I had Rakic, by, or not Rakic, I had Prohaska by submission. I thought he would hurt him and then submit him. And Rakic looked real good for the first time in his career he, to me. He looked, he was fun to watch. He had good kicks. Uh, his straight hand, right hand was, his right straight was on the button of the entire fight. But you could see in that matchup that Yuri was just n not deniable. He, there was no denying him in this fight, and he broke Rackage, which, if you watched my live, I called to a fucking T. It was 100% to a T, what I thought was going to happen. Yuri, hard, it's going to be hard, he's going to break him, and he's going to finish him. I thought it'd be by submission, but it was by TKO or KO, and it was awesome. Next, we go to Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage. I, I thought Brund, Brundage would look good later in the second and the third round. Now, Brundage had moments. He threw Bo Nickel down to the ground. It was a wild thing to see. The issue is, and this is why Brundage is Cody Brundage, is that he puts himself in bad positions and then stays in those bad positions and then puts himself into a worse position. Instead of knowing, training all these things and knowing how to get out of it, 
and he does the exact opposite. It's like the Rodolfo Vieira fight where it's like, hey, stop putting your, your neck in that area. Hey, stop doing this. He keeps doing it, and then he gets caught. And that's what happens in this one. Bo Nickel, I didn't think, looked great. I thought he forced a lot of things, but he also was able to force some things against a guy like Cody Brundage, who did throw Bo Nickel off of him. We did see that. And Bo Nickel, we've seen the pressure he has when he gets your back. Again, it is a guy, it is against a guy like Cody Brundage, but still, he did what he had to do. He got the job done. I don't do I think he should be as hard on himself as he it was? No. But could he have made it a little bit cleaner? Sure. But it's also the best wrestler that we've seen him fight. And Brundage did shuck him off a few times. So maybe a little bit of learning experience there, maybe some distance control there from Bo Nickel. Um, and I do, I think Bo, uh, Cody Brunnage needed to force the action like he did in the first. No, I think it's probably the worst thing he could have done, but I digress. Got that one wrong. Next we have Armin Suyuka defeating Charles Oliveira by split decision. Um, Charles Oliveira got a guillotine choke. One of the nastiest guillotine chokes I've seen. He got it early. Uh, so you can shorts were falling off of him. Like the land of Venata, Charles Jordan fight, which was, or yeah. Land of Anato, Charles Jordan. Um, I personally thought Charles could have gotten the job, couldn't got, could have gotten the nod, but the fight was so close, it didn't really matter to me. None of their stocks dropped, honestly, at all. Uh, Oliveira had good striking in this one. His grappling was great. The biggest difference was Sayukin so, so, so had a lot of top control time, which is weird to score when you have a fire willingly going to the ground um, because their guard is very good. And, and, Charles Oliveira had three submissions, almost finishing the fight. One in the first, like we had said. Another one in the, at the end of the second. He had a triangle. It was locked in. And then number three, he had a Doris at the end of that round. So I thought the more finishing sequences were from Oliveira. But Sayuki did very, very good with controlling. And he had really good uh, elbows as well. People call them elbows, but elbows as well. So great job for Armin. Great job for Charles. Neither fighter... I mean, the, the, Charles Oliveira didn't look like he was done. He looked motivated, and he was. it was a very, very fun fight. So, great job on that one. Didn't really matter because Dustin Poirier is fighting Nizla Makachev. So, yeah. Next, we have Max Holloway versus Justin Gaethje. Um, and people... People called... This fight, the worst nightmare and worst matchup for Max Holloway. And I did a video talking about this where I said, we have to remember, it's not like Holloway's going to go and then he's just going to brawl with Gaethje. Because that's a 50-50. That's who the fuck knows. Here you go. Let's test it. You know, and I, I understand, you know, Gaethje broke his nose, which was a spinning back attack from Holloway, spinning back kick from Holloway, which, yeah, yeah, sure. Someone told me last night on the stream, yeah, if he broke his nose, it changed the course of the fight. But then why are you closing the distance like that? You put He put himself there. He ducked right into a spinning back kick. Either way. Was a couple eye pokes, but again, you can't use that as an excuse why he lost because Gaethje said, I'm good, let's fight. Was it factors? Maybe. But if it was that big of a factor, don't fight. That's the reality on that. And also, even before the eye pokes, Max Holloway was whooping his ass. There was one single second that it looked like Gaethje knocked Holloway down and Holloway got right back up and kept fighting him. One single second. Other than that, Max Holloway was whooping that ass, beating him up, and then Max Holloway calls for him in the middle of the octagon and says, let's go. And Gaethje says, okay. And they throw down in the middle for the last 10 seconds and, Ga and Holloway catches Gaethje with one second left and flatlines him and face plants him. It was beautiful. I love to see it. I'm, I told everybody, don't be counting out Max Holloway because he's the better striker. Maybe not power-wise, but he's a better technical striker. He has more output. Gaethje's there to be hit. He's very hittable, like I said. He does get hurt, and he's been finished. And the reason why Gaethje's had success as of recent when he fights these guys is because the first round, um, Gaethje gets hit a lot, gets all this. And then they tire out. And then Gage is able to pick his shots because they could become more flat-footed. Holloway's not that guy. Not that guy. And that's what we've seen. So, got that one right. So, let's go. Zhang Weili versus Yan Xiaonan. What a fight this was. Uh, Zhang Weili submitted 
Yan, Yan Xiaonan at the end of the first round. And then Yan wakes up, walks to her corner, and continues the fight. Baller. Baller of a move. Uh, and then Yan seems like she's starting to come back. I believe in the second and the third round, it seems like she's starting to come back. It was like, oh, this is going to be interesting. Fourth and fifth round. And then Zhang Wei Li just finds her second win. Finds her groove. She seemed like she was gassing a little bit after that crazy first round. And again, can't, couldn't blame her at all. And, you know, Zhang Wei Li just showed how much of a champion she is. I mean, she, like I said, she finished Yan. We seen it. She choked her out cold. Got a little tired, recovered a little bit, and then continued to beat her ass. That's that's what happened. That's the reality of that. Yan had some good moments on the feet. I believe dropped uh, Zhang Weili once in the fourth or the fifth, something like that, with a straight. Um, uh, maybe earlier at some point though. Um, Yan showed that she should have been in there, but in in at retrospect, you look back at it. Zhang submitted her in the first round, at the end of the first round. It went to a decision, yes, but Zhang Weili submitted her in the first round. So yeah. And then we go to the main event, which obviously I was wrong. I thought Jamal Hill's Jamal Hill's awkward uh, striking would give Pereira a lot of issues. It did not. Um, and I think a big th- reason why that was was Jamal Hill wasn't moving forward. Jamal Hill wasn't dictating the action, and we seen very quickly that Alex Pereira noticed that he was letting that Jamal Hill was letting Pereira dictate where this fight was going. You know, and I think that's that's a big distinct thing that people aren't talking about is Yuri Prohaska was able to have Alex move backwards because Pereira Prohaska was just going at him. You know, Jan Blachowicz was going at Pereira. And we've seen Pereira was able to be hit in those matchups, which was like, oh, you can't do that. And if he fights like that, Jamal Hill is going to have a whirlwind of uh, ways to hit Pereira because of his style. Now, what Pereira did so beautifully was not lay off the gas, pick his shots, did miss some leg kicks, which was odd. But again, Jamal's in a different stance, so it kind of made sense. So I knew the uh, uh, leg kicks weren't going to be an X factor because different stance. Um, not going to be that type of a fight, you know. Um, and Jamal Hill wasn't throwing his hands. And we see immediately that if Jamal Hill is not moving forward on Alex Pereira, it's going to be hard for Jamal to connect on Alex. Because the thing that was going to make this fight so interesting was if Pereira is against that cage and, and Hill can throw these awkward shots, can he land on him? I thought he could. He couldn't get Pereira against the cage. He couldn't get him to back up. And that was the biggest difference. You know, and again, I'm fine with getting this wrong because like I said in my breakdown, I didn't see a version of Pereira that we had seen against Bohavich and uh, 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 Yuri Prohaska that was backing up. I didn't see a version of that beating Jamal Hill. I see a version, obviously, as I said, it's dangerous. He's going to have to be careful. He's going to have to pick his shots. In, in the open, it's going to be hard. But against the cage, it's not hard for Jamal Hill because he'd be able to connect on him. Um, and Pereira, dude, it was one of the sickest moments I probably have ever seen in my life. Jamal uh, kicks Pereira on the belt line. It wasn't like right on the cup, but it was on the belt line. And Herb goes to break it up, and uh, Pereira goes. And then they continue, and not even, what, 10 seconds later, he hits Jamal. As Jamal is throwing these awkward punches in the open, which was an issue, um, he skimmed Jamal Hill's nose upward. With all that left hook, and that was it. You know, Jamal was still there because, like, he went out and then he was still there. He put his legs up, and then Pereira just moved the legs and then ended up finishing him on the ground. Crazy to see Jamal Hill flatline like that. But it, I mean, when Pereira is moving forward, if Pereira moved forward against Prohaska, if your Pereira moved forward against Jan, the conversation about Jamal Hill you know, being able to land on Pereira wouldn't have been a big thing. It wouldn't have been a thing that we talked about. Um, you know, so Pereira, and then he called out Tom Aspinall, said he wants to fight a heavyweight. I think that's absolutely incredible. This man right here is is nothing but history, historic. 
You know, and Jamal, as we've seen, was game as hell. Wanted to fight him. Wanted to, to be face-to-face -face with him. But as soon as Prayer realized Jamal Hill is not going to be backing him up, that was the end of the fight, and we noticed it. Three minutes and 14 seconds. Pereira looked incredible. Jamal Hill looked second-guessing his uh, punches. Throwing some nasty body kicks, some, some good leg kicks, but just the striking, moving backwards for Jamal Hill was not what Jamal Hill needed to do. So great job for Pereira finding that shot. Great job for Pereira for not giving any, any, any shits at all, but calling out Aspinall at heavyweight in Brazil. Very soon, I love it. But as always, guys, subscribe, like, comment. Let me know who you are picking. Not picking, but let me know what you, who you guys picked. Let me know what your thoughts were. How did you think 300 was? I thought it was incredible. Out of 10, it was probably an 8.5 out of 10. Out of 5, probably a 4.5 out of 5. So, very good night, night of fights. What? There was probably one not-so-great fight. That was probably the Sterling Cater fight probably have to say that but again good night of fights really enjoyed it turner could have gotten a ko not great but again good night of fights thank you guys so much for being here subscribe like comment if you are new and as always peace